Hello all. Welcome to this session in our continued effort to have some discussions about uh, uh, topics relevant for NEET. Today we will be discussing some crucial aspects of the chapter locomotion and movement. Locomotion and movement chapter deals with uh, the musculoskeletal system, muscular system and the skeletal system. There are, there are a few concepts in musculoskeletal system which might be problematic for many students. So I will take up those concepts and discuss, discuss as much as possible in this short session. We will start with uh, the muscular system, the muscle. Muscle contraction is, a, is an area of discomfort for many students. To understand muscle contraction, you need to, you need to know some relevant basics of the muscle anatomy. You consider one muscle cell, the, my, the myofiber, one muscle cell will have multiple units of contraction. The basic, the basic task for a muscle is to contract and relax. It contracts and relaxes. Based on its arrangement and alignment, the muscles will bring about different movements. So wherever the muscles are, they are designed to bring about movements. How they are arranged and where they are attached determines what kind of movements are possible. We will be, let, let's have a small discussion on the relevance of muscles for bringing about skeletal movement. So the, the, the bone forms the framework for the body, the skeleton forms the framework for the body and bone muscles are attached to these bones whose contraction and relaxation brings about movement of the skeleton. Consider biceps. Biceps has attachment at the shoulder joint and at the elbow joint. So this movement, the, the contraction of shoulder, the, the contraction of biceps will bring about movement of the arm, movement of the forearm. Contraction of muscles will cause shortening of the muscles and relaxation makes the muscles longer. How is shortening and relaxation happening? That we have to see. Muscles are made up of short so functional units called sarcomeres. Now in a single muscle cell, there can be multiple sarcomeres. You need to understand that each sarcomere is a sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle and each sarcomere is not the same as one muscle cell. In other systems when we study, when we study the functional unit of uh, kidney, we say nephron. Each nephron is a functional unit of kidney. In, neur in the nervous system, neuron is, is, is an individual cell and that is the functional unit of nervous system. In muscles, one muscle cell has multiple sarcomeres and sarcomere is the functional unit of the muscle. If we understand how the sarcomere shortens and elongates, that is contraction and relaxation can be understood by understanding the functioning of the sarcomere. Consider you, if you have a diagram in front of you of the sarcomere, you can just uh, refer it and visualize what I say. Now consider this to be the muscle cell and there are multiple sarcomeres. I am taking one sarcomere and there are two boundaries. There are two boundaries. There is a thin fibrous band. There are thin fibrous bands acting as the boundary for the sarcomere. You can call those fibrous bands as Z lines. They are zigzag lines. Z lines. They are the limiting membrane. So sarcomere structurally you can say is the segment of the muscle between two adjacent, sarco adjacent Z lines. Now attached to these Z lines are filaments. Thin filaments and thick filaments. Before we understand thin and thick filaments, you need to know there are some contractile proteins that make up muscles. Contractile proteins making up muscles. Actin, myosin are the two important contractile proteins. Thin filament is made up of, thin filament is made up of three proteins. Actin, troponin and tropomyosin. Thick filament is made up of a single protein, miromyosin. To make the thin filament, there are small globular actin proteins which will join together to form a thread. Now the globular actin is called G-actin and they join to form a thread. It's like a, it's like a, a chain of beads. That chain is the F-actin or filamentous actin. There are small small globules, there are small masses, globular masses of actin joining together to form a, form a long strand that is the F-actin. Coiled around this F-actin is tropomyosin. So there is, there is actin, F-actin and coiled around it is tropomyosin. Attached at uh, frequent places is troponin. Three components, the core formed by, the, formed by actin, fibrous uh, filamentous actin. Coiled around the F-actin is the tropomyosin and attached at frequent intervals is the troponin. Thin filament and thick filament will have to bind together to bring about contraction. So when, when, the, when the thick filament attaches to the thin filament and pulls it, the, the Z lines get closer to each other and there is contraction of the muscle. 
unless there is contact between the thin filament and the thick filament, there is no contraction possible. For that to happen, the thick filament will have to attach to certain places on the thin filament. The places where, the sites where the thick filament attaches to the thin filament is called the head binding site. The thick filament is, uh, is L-shaped in structure. So it has a tail and a neck and a head. The head of the thick filament will have to attach to the binding site of thin filament. When they bind, the, the flexion, of the head, flexion of the neck of the thick filament will cause pulling of the thin filament which further pulls the Z-line bringing about contraction of the muscle fiber, contraction of the sarcomere, thereby shortening the muscle. Now, for that to happen, the thick filament will have to attach to the thin filament. Attachment of this is prevented by troponin blocking the binding site. Unless the tropomyosin troponin complex is dislodged from the binding site, the head of the thick filament cannot bind to the site it is supposed to bind and contraction is not possible. Now, we will just summarize the structure. There is Z-line, two Z-lines between which, this is the segment between which is called the sarcomere. Attached to the Z-lines are thin filaments at frequent intervals. All around the thin filaments, or if this is the thin filament, all around it are thick filaments. You have to visualize this in three dimension. Thick filament is between thin filaments. If there are thin filaments like this, consider my palm to be the uh, Z-lines. These are the thin filaments and thick filaments are here between the thin filaments. Holding the thin filament, holding the thick filament in position is another fibrous band called M-line. So there are Z-lines which acts as the boundary for the sarcomere to which are attached the thin filaments. Thick filaments are in between the thin filaments. It appears like they are suspended in, in space between the thin filaments but it is not. They are also held by a thin membrane fibrous band called M-line. You can, you can find some regions adjacent to the Z-line there is a region of non-overlap between the thick, thick and thin filament. This zone is called I-band, I-band or isotropic band. That means when you observe it under a microscope, it all appears uniform. And there is a segment where thin filament and thick filament overlaps. That segment of the sarcomere where thick and thin filament overlaps is called the A-band or anisotropic band. Anisotropic band is where, the, where the, there, there is no uniformity in the appearance. In between this, there is a segment, small segment, where there is own, where you find only the thick filament and not the thin filaments. So again, there is a segment of non-overlap between thick and thin filaments, but you find only the thick filaments at the center of the sarcomere. That region is called H band or H zone. H zone. Now this is the thin filament, this is the thick filament. When there is binding of head of the thick filament to the thin filament, there is pulling H zone contracts. And the overlap between thick and thin filament increases. That means when contraction of the sarcomere happens, two zones are shortening. The I band and the H zone. I band and H zone shrinks. Physically, there is nothing, there is, there is, no, there is no shortening of any of the components making up the sarcomere. The Z line remains the same size what it was. The thin filaments remain what it was structurally. Thick filament remains what it was structurally. Because there is sliding of the thick filament over the thin filament, or there is sliding of the thin and thick filaments towards each other, there is shortening of the sarcomere by pulling of the Z lines towards each other. This theory which describes the contraction of muscle is called uh, sliding filament theory. So in summary, what you have to remember about the structure and contraction of the muscle is, Z lines are the boundary for the sarcomere, attached to the Z lines are thin filaments, between the thin filaments, you have thick filaments. When the thick filament attaches to the thin filaments and contracts or flexes, there is pulling of the thin filaments and in turn pulling of the Z lines towards each other, making the sarcomere shorter. And this in the entire muscle brings about contraction of the muscle and shortening of the muscle. Few more aspects you need to understand here. Pulling of the thin filament is an active process which requires hydrolysis of ATP. Energy is required and that energy comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. The head of the thick filament has two specific sites. One site is called the thin filament binding site and another site is the ATP hydrolysis site. So head of thick filament acts as the enzyme which can break down ATP. When ATP is broken down, energy is released and that energy is used for the flexion of the neck of the thick filament bringing about contraction.
Another complication here we need to understand. The troponin tropomyosin complex blocks the binding site on thin filament. If head of the thick filament cannot bind, there is no contraction possible. There has to be dislodging of the troponin tropomyosin complex from the thin filament where the head of the thick filament binds. What brings about this dislodging of the troponin tropomyosin complex from the binding site? It is calcium. Binding of calcium to troponin will change the conformation of troponin tropomyosin complex, dislodging that troponin tropomyosin complex from that binding site that exposes the binding site for head of thick filament, making the head attached to the thin filament and bring about contraction. Calcium is the most important ion required for muscle contraction, skeletal muscle contraction predominantly. Now, the release of calcium happens when there is stimulation of the muscle by a nerve impulse. When the nerve impulse is, when, when the nerve impulse reaches the muscle, there is triggering of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is the endoplasmic reticulum of muscles. Endoplasmic reticulum in muscles is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It acts as a storehouse for calcium. When the muscle is triggered by a nerve impulse, calcium is released. Calcium goes and binds to the uh, troponin tropomyosin complex, dislodging it from the binding site, making contraction possible. Deficiency of calcium will, will hamper this process and muscle contraction gets affected if calcium is deficient. Release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is dependent on the presence of a protein in the muscle cell. And this protein is called dystrophin protein. Dystrophin protein. If you remember studying in genetics, dystrophin is a protein produced by a gene, which is a dystrophin gene, which, is, uh, which has its predominant presence on, on the X chromosome. The dystrophin gene is the longest gene of human body. Defect in the dystrophin gene will lead to a disease. You recall the disease, it is muscular dystrophy. We will discuss that later. Now, dystrophin gene should be produced in sufficient, dystrophin gene should be active, dystrophin protein needs to be produced, that triggers, that brings about the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium binds to troponin tropomyosin complex, dislodging of the troponin tropomyosin complex, binding of head of the thick filament, muscle contraction is possible. The chain of events you need to understand to understand muscle contraction. So with this background understanding of muscle contraction, we will discuss some of the disorders associated with muscle contraction. One, deficiency of calcium. Deficiency of calcium will lead to a disease called tetany. Tetany leads to uh, uh, no, uh, spasmodic movements of the muscles. The muscles will go into twitching, twitching and contraction. It fixes in contraction. Why? Sufficient calcium is required in the sarcoplasmic reticulum in, sarco in, in the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber for the calcium to be pushed back into sarcoplasmic reticulum. If there is calcium deficiency, there is engagement of calcium for contraction of the muscle, but displacement of calcium and pushing it back into sarcoplasmic reticulum gets affected, thereby causing the muscle to go into a state of continued contraction, spasm, tetany. Another disease, another disease which which uh, is a bacterial disease leads to similar kind of symptoms where the muscles go into contraction and fix in contraction but the disease is pathogenic it is that is it is caused by a toxin toxin produced by the bacterium clostridium tetany the disease is tetanus tetanus toxin tetanus toxin mimics mimics acetylcholine and binds to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle and the binding of tetanus toxin to these receptors on the muscle is irreversible. When it binds irreversibly, see when, uh, when acetylcholine binds to the receptors, muscles go into contraction. But acetylcholine cannot remain on those receptors forever because there is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase which will remove the acetylcholine from the, uh, from, the, from the side, from its binding side, from its receptor, thereby making the muscle to relax. But when this toxin, tetanus toxin binds to the receptor, of acetylcholine, it brings about continuous contraction. The enzyme cannot remove this toxin from the binding site. Muscle goes into permanent contraction. Tetanus leads to universal contraction of all the muscles. When all the muscles go into a state of full contraction, the flexors of the body, that is the, the muscles which bring about flexion, bending of the joints, is weaker than the extensors. 
when when flexors are weaker than the extensors and both go into contraction simultaneously the body will go into a state of extension tetanus you will find the patient going into a state of universal extension the body bends backwards like a bow tetanus is a very painful disease tetanus uh, cure of tetanus when when it is affected is very less likely um, you you are aware that whenever you sustain an injury tetanus is spread through spores spores of the tetanus toxa or tet clostridium tetani it is uh, spread through contaminated wounds so it's in the soil it's in cow dung and my, when the wounds get when when there is when there are open wounds and they get soiled there is likelihood of tetanus getting you know getting tetanus so whenever you sustain an injury you take that vaccine tetanus toxoid which is a vaccination against the toxin of tetanus so we have discussed tetany and tetanus there is another disorder there is another disorder of the muscular system that you need to know it is myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder where the body develops autoimmunity against acetylcholine now the 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 neurotransmitter which was supposed to stimulate the muscle gets attacked by the antibodies produced by the body body should not produce antibodies against its own components but here the body is producing antibodies against something which is supposed to cause muscle contraction but it's not like when acetylcholine is released the entire acetylcholine can be attacked simultaneously over a period of time the response of the immune system becomes more and more stronger so initially the person will start developing weakness of muscles and as the as the disease progresses the severity of weakness increases myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder so we have seen the anatomy of sarcomere the physiology of muscle contraction thick and thin filaments thick filament is made up of three proteins remember actin troponin tropomyosin thin filament is made up of single protein meromyosin we have seen how the engagement of thick and thin filament happens what is necessary for it calcium how is various calcium released from it is released from sarcoplasmic reticulum what is what is required for release of calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum dystrophin protein dystrophin protein is produced by a gene dystrophin gene defect in the dystrophin gene will lead to the disease muscular dystrophy there are several forms of muscular dystrophy the last disease that we will discuss in muscular system several forms of muscular dystrophy having their basis in both autosomes as well as allosomes or in both somatic chromosomes as well as sex chromosomes but the most severe form of muscular dystrophy is duchenne's muscular dystrophy or dmd the gene for which is present in x chromosome it's a x linked recessive disorder x linked recessive disorder so if you are if you can recall x linked recessive disorders have a higher probability of expression in males not lesser probability in females because the females will require females will require two recessive genes to be transmitted now the symptoms of uh, duchenne's muscular dystrophy will be progressive weakening of the muscles leading to complete paralysis of muscles starting with the limb muscles and finally terminating with diaphragm which is also a skeletal muscle leading to respiratory failure and death in duchenne's muscular dystrophy in severe forms of duchenne's muscular dystrophy the person the kid starts developing symptoms at around 6 to 7 years of age and by the time the kid is around 16 to 18 most probably the death death is certain one aspect of muscular dystrophy you need to understand it is impossible for a female to get this disease females are carriers in duchenne's muscular dystrophy but it is impossible for a female to get this disease duchenne's muscular dystrophy because for the female to get this disease one defective x chromosome should be passed on from the father that is from the male now if there if there is a defective x chromosome with uh, with the defective muscular dystrophy the dystrophin gene the male will be affected by muscular dystrophy an affected male most certainly would die by the time he attains sexual maturity so a male who is affected by muscular dystrophy is extremely unlikely to pass on that defective gene in that x chromosome to the progeny so the cases of duchenne's muscular dystrophy in females is almost absent this i think we should be uh, uh, stopping this discussion on um, muscular system in skeletal system in skeletal system we have to look we have to look at the structure of the skeleton joints and a few disorders
structure of skeleton you have to remember the names of the bones in the skeleton there are 206 bones in our body skeletal system can be skeleton can be segregated into different diff, you know divided into two types axial skeleton that that is which forms the axis of the body and appendicular skeleton which forms the basis for the appendages appendages are limbs in the axial skeleton you have head and neck the thorax which is constituted by the ribs and these vertebral column in the vertebral, vertebral column at the back abdomen supported by the vertebral column again appendicular skeleton includes the girdles the shoulder girdle or the pectoral girdle, pelvic girdle and the limb bones. You can just run through the um, bones. I will just uh, help you with remembering the axial skeleton. There are bones in the skull, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital. So 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, 6. There are two bones forming the base of the skull, ethmoid and sphenoid. Eight bones in the skull cranium eight bones forming the cranium cranium is the brain box in the face the bone which forms the uh, support for the lacrimal glands is lacrimal bridge of the nose is nasal here is vomer zygomatic maxilla palatine which forms the palate two bones which forms the uh, uh, nasal support that inside the nose they are called inferior nasal concha and mandible one bone in the neck that is hyoid bone then you have 12 pairs of ribs and 26 bones in the vertebral column that is the um, appendicular skeleton uh, axial skeleton and there are six bones in the ears three in each ear malleus incus stapes this is the axial skeleton one important uh, question you should be ready with is there, there, there can be questions uh, questions about which is a single which is a single bone hyoid is a single bone mandible is also a single bone if either of them are given in combination with other, other bones, you can choose mandible if it is the only one or hyoid if it is the only one given of the four options. But when, if both are given, if mandible and hyoid, both bones are given in, in among the options, which one do you choose? It would be wise to choose hyoid bone because hyoid is a single bone from developmental stages whereas mandible is a fused bone. There are two bones that forms during development and it fuses at the center. So if you have to choose between mandible and hyoid, choose hyoid. Otherwise, most often, more, most often it will be one of these two bones that will be given in combination with other options. This is the axial skeleton. Appendicular skeleton, you have the, the scapula, which is the shoulder blade, clavicle, which is called the collarbone, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals and phalanges. In the lower limb, you have pelvic girdle or it's called the coxal bones made up of three bones, ileum, ischium, pubis. In the thigh bone, femur, kneecap, patella, leg bones, tibia and fibula, metatars, met, uh, metatarsals, tarsals, metatarsals and phalanges. 126 bones in the appendicular skeleton, 80 bones in the axial skeleton making it 206 bones. Joints are the junction between bones. There are three types of joints. Joints where there is no gap between the bones. That means the bones are fused together. Those joints are do not allow for movements. These joints are called fixed joints or immovable joints or fibrous joints. Joints which allow some movement between them are called cartilaginous joints. They will have some cartilaginous plate. They will have a cartilaginous plate between them. The, the joints between the skull bones, the cranial bones, they are fibrous joints. They are fused. You don't have movement between those bones. The joint formed between vertebral bones, between two vertebrae, you have a disc what you call as the intervertebral disc. It's a, it's a cartilage that is present between the two bones. It provides for short range of movements. It is partially movable joint, but there is no space between the joints. This is, these are cartilaginous joints. The third and most predominant type of joint is synovial joint, where the bones do not touch each other. There is a space between the bones. The space is enclosed by a closed, closed enclosed by various membranes, which makes it a closed cavity. And inside that cavity will be fluid. It's, it, it, it kind of lubricates the joint. These joints are called synovial joints. All of this, shoulder, shoulder joint, uh, wrist, you know, elbow, wrist, all of these are synovial joints. A few disorders of the skeletal system you need to know. One, uh, arthritis. Arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Two, three types of arthritis you remember. One is um, uh, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is some pathology of the bone, some injury or infection of the bone or some de some disease in the bone leading to inflammation in the joints. Osteoarthritis. There can be multiple reasons for that. 
Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder where the joint space will be attacked by the immune system. It is due to attack of the immune attack of the joints by the immune system. There is inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis. Third one is a metabolic cause, gouty arthritis. Gout is a disorder where there is increased levels of uric acid in the body. Increased levels of uric acid will lead to deposition of uric acid crystals in the joints. When, when there are some foreign body deposited in the joint space, that leads to irritation of the joint leading to inflammation. That causes pain, pain and deformity in the joints. So three types of arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and gouty arthritis. And the osteoporosis is demineralization of bone happens as a natural power uh, happens as a part of the aging process. I think this much in the skeletal system should do. I have tried to summarize the most crucial aspects of skeletal system as well as the muscular system, musculoskeletal system. Um, we will take up some questions. We will take up some questions now before we conclude the session. Sliding filament theory. Sliding filament theory I already um, discussed. There is thin filament, there is thick filament. Thin filament and thick filament comes into contact by the attachment of the head of thick filament to the thin filament. ATP is hydrolyzed, the neck of the thick filament flexes. That means it, it pulls the thin filament towards the inner side, making the Z lines coming closer to each other, bringing about contraction. Yeah. Can head of binding site be made much more clearer? Shiva Subramanian. You can consider the thick filament like this. This is the tail of the thick filament, neck of the thick filament and the head of the thick filament. Head is a globular head. It's a globular head. You consider this to be the head of thick filament, a globular head. There are two sides. One which goes and attaches to the thin filament and the other one which will bind ATP and breaks down ATP. When ATP is broken down, energy is released. That energy is used to flex. So the task for the head of thick filament is two. One, attach to the thin filament. Two, break down ATP to release energy. Use that energy to flex. Neck will flex, pulling the thin filament, making the uh, Z lines come closer to each other and contraction of sarcomere. One more. What are spasms? Please explain. Spasms are sudden and unrelieving contractions of muscles. Muscles go into contraction and they don't uh, get back into relaxation. Causes can be many. If you are uh, over exerting your muscle, the muscles get injured and the muscles um, would want to relax. If the muscles need to recover, the muscles go into a type of spasm called protective spasm. If they don't go into that spas go, uh, spasms are painful when the muscles go into forceful contraction when you don't want it to contract but it goes into contraction like you might have experienced this uh, spasms of calf muscles which happens commonly for many people of uh, the younger age adolescents experience that more calf muscles when you are sleeping goes into sudden contraction and you are you have you have terrible pain in your calf in your legs you do you can't relax it it will relax on its own so spasms are sudden and painful contractions of muscles causes can be many one of the causes you can be uh, aware of is injury to the muscle or the muscle getting overexerted muscle as a as a mode of protecting itself goes into spasm and prevents you from performing any activity it will remain in that spasm till it recovers to a reasonable extent yeah last question we will take how does slip disc happen and how is it treated see the, the disc is the uh, cartilage, fibrocartilage, it's a fibrocartilage between the two vertebral bones. If there is compression of the disc, there is a, there is a small, there is a jelly-like substance in the disc. If there is compression of the disc, for whatever reason, injury or uh, even um, uh, you know, overweight, obesity also can lead to compression of the disc. If the disc compresses, there can be bulging out of the membrane of the disc. And if there is an injury, cause in injury causing sudden movement of this uh, sudden movement of the vertebral bones causing the disc to slip from its position slip disc 
one of the reasons why uh, you need to wear seat belt is that because when there is when the body is in a is in a high velocity moment when 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 in vehicle and there is sudden application of brakes the body continues to be in motion and the vehicle stops there will be a whiplash it's like you are you are uh, using a whip the body goes into a whiplash moment bringing about sudden and forceful movement a forceful movement of the vertebral bones leading to dislodging of the disc it can happen due to other types of injuries also mostly injuries or over exertion of the bones or compression of the disc space i think um, um, we should be able to close this session now i i hope that you have learned some things which you did not know and you have got some of the concepts cleared if you have further questions you can write in the comments and uh, i will try to answer the relevant ones and there are more videos on um, our app by use the learning app you can go through those videos and learn further thank you very much all the best neat is approaching fast study consistently put in your best efforts good things will happen thank you